Mark chapter 10, verse 2. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Moses tell you to do? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man must leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two become one flesh. So they were no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And again, I spoke about that word means glued together. And again, in, in the current situation, I'm not that interested in arguing philosophically with people. And I'm not that uh, interested even in arguing with people who don't believe because they come from a premise that's very different. Although, uh, as we're led by God and as is appropriate, we do speak out. But the most important thing for us is, is that we're followers of Jesus Christ. And we follow his teaching, we follow his word and we follow something that has been established for 2,000 years in Christian circles, has been the tradition of the church uh, for 2,000 years and was God's original intention in the beginning, even though the Jewish people somewhat uh, minimise that because of their hardness of heart, as Jesus said. And I think that we all need to understand that. You know, we, we need to understand that, you know, there's good arguments that we can have, uh, very, very positive arguments. But ultimately, I hold this position because Jesus Christ told me to hold this position. Because ultimately, this was God's intention from the beginning. And because... Um, it's been the practice of the church for 2,000 years. So there's no argument. There's no having to justify anything, really, in one sense. You know, I know I'm not saying don't do what you're supposed to do. I'm simply trying to take it to what matters. And this is what matters. And see, when, when we fail to preach, it's interesting because I saw an interview actually with the Coptic Pope this week. And they asked him some questions. And one of the questions was, why, why in the West are churches declining? Um, and he was very good. He didn't criticise anyone. But he said, when we get away from the teaching of Jesus Christ and preaching God's word, our churches will start to decline. Okay, so that's very simple. So that's why we continue to the best of our ability to do that. We don't do it perfectly. And I know there are many of us have different views on the fringes of Christianity. We can't cater for everyone. We can't please everyone. But in the essentials, we will not deviate from the Word of God. And that's the final position. There's no argument beyond that. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm not going to take any other stand because of that alone. So, to go on to do a little bit more reading of the Scriptures in Hebrews chapter 1 today, we read that Jesus Christ is the answer to everything. So, as we read the first few verses, I'll get there in a minute, to Hebrews chapter 1. Again, going back to what Jesus was doing with the Pharisees, you know, in the, in the Old Covenant, things were uh, piecemeal. Uh, they were provisional. It wasn't, it was an unveiling revelation because the revelation is Jesus Christ. He's the revelation. Everything in the Old Covenant is pointing or moving towards Jesus Christ and what he taught. So when we read the Old Covenant, we have to read it in that light. Otherwise, this is how we get a lot of different views and we, people go off on tangents here and there and everywhere. 
Because we've got to understand that the, f the fulfillment of that is Jesus Christ. Everything points to that. And so every scripture in the Old Covenant has to be taken in reference to Jesus Christ. And the book of Hebrews says here, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And making purification for sin, he sat at the right hand of the majesty on high, having overcome, having become as much superior to angels as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. So, you know, again, Jesus Christ is the reason we're here. Jesus Christ is the one we worship. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Jesus Christ's uh, teachings are the teachings we follow. Now, I know you, there are some teachings we're not... But there, is, there are teachings like this that are very clear. It's not peripheral or it's not something you, you know, that's a little bit unclear. It's very, very clear what Jesus said. And here I'm going to use um, some reference to Tim Keller, uh, one of his talks, to help try to explain. Well, why, why don't we dialogue and accommodate other opinions, and other people. Well, in real life, we have to. If we're a decent human being, we listen to people. We try to hear their point of view. And by the way, again, we, uh, Jesus never hated anyone. He loved people, and it's our job to love everybody. And we heard this morning about forgiveness. It's not our job to, um, you know to put down people. And if people, uh, you know, uh, lead a, a lifestyle that they, they choose, then we still have to love them. We don't, don't agree with them. We don't endorse that lifestyle, but we love them. We don't, we don't ever, ever, ever preach hatred, ever. Um, it's always the love of God. But lo the love, love does not mean that we accommodate everything and everyone's opinions into our belief. That is not what real love is. Real love means that we have a position, and that position, again, is in Christ and through Christ, and in that position and through the love of Christ in us, loving the person, we explain our position. And, um, um, you know, the, the, the letter of the Hebrews was written to um, and we're not quite sure, probably obviously Jewish people, so it could be Rome, we're not 100% sure, but it was written to urban Christians and it was written to a society not that dissimilar from ours. It was written to a complex society. It was not uh, the society we knew 50 years ago in this country or even 20 years ago. It was a society with many religions and many beliefs and many sects, even within Judaism. Um, you know, you had a, it, it, was, it was a letter. And basically the Hebrews were saying, we're, getting, we're having it tough. It's tough to follow Christ. It really is tough. We've been persecuted. We've not been treated well. We're scared to express our opinion. And so Paul writes to them, trying to encourage them, because they were facing greater persecution than we are, much greater. We, we, you know, the persecution for us hasn't even begun yet. But that's the sort of letter, that's the sort of appeal that Paul, uh, well, whoever wrote it, you know, probably not Paul, but whoever wrote the um, the, 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 whoever was the writer of the Hebrews, it doesn't really matter. It's God's word, that's what matters. So the, the people were suffering, and this book tries to address that. Um, 
And what, what, what the writer to the Hebrews is trying to say to the people, that life is a journey from weariness into rest. And the only way we're going to get home is by keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. Because life is a journey. You get dished out things you don't deserve in life. Some things I created, I've caused the problem. But some things I didn't create the problem. They were dished out to me. We all have a mixed bag of those two things. What we've done and what others have done to us. And the reality is society will dish up the same thing. Our society, our Western society has dished up some very good things. And those that have just been to Uganda would agree. I was, I was out with Michael Chkembri yesterday watching the women's soccer game between Australia and Brazil. And um, um, there's no doubt that our Western society, which is basically based on the Judeo-Christian ethic, with a little bit of Greek philosophy thrown in there, Greek thinking, um, is the basis of our society. And there's been a lot of good things that have come out of that. A lot of good things. And we, you know, we, we're not... Um, we're not adverse to those good things. We want them, we love them. But then there are other things that aren't so good that we are inheriting. And, you know, if you go to Uganda, even though they don't have all the good things that we have, they have some things better than we do. As, as, as it's clear that evil is evil and good is good. We're not sure here. In fact, some people call good evil and evil good. And that's a real problem, and that's where we have to be discerning. And how, we, how are we to be discerning? Well, simply by conforming ourselves more to the radiance of Jesus Christ. We change by adjusting to Jesus and his teaching. You see, that's why it's not enough to raise your hand. It's not enough to get slain in the Spirit. It's not enough to move in the gifts. It's not enough to get excited about God. You have to also, that's very important, also be conformed to his teaching. If we're not conformed to his teaching, then we only have half the gospel. And it's very important that we understand that in, in, the, in the Bible, in the, the Hebrews, the urgency to, to do is to be transformed to the teachings of Christ. That doesn't always mean popularity. It sometimes means persecution. That's what we're trying to communicate today. And this will be the last time, obviously, that I will be speaking in this manner because from here on is between you and the Lord. Jesus brings the final word. And how this changes our lives. Through, the, through Jesus, God has spoken. Jesus is the manifestation of God the Father, it says, is the radiance. We have a God who's personal, who's relational. And as it said, in the past God spoke in many ways, but in the New Testament, the final word comes through Jesus Christ. And you know, in life... Um, we have to make adjustments. So when two people get married, there's adjustments to be made. Usually the first year is a hard year, particularly if people have married a bit later, because you're set in your ways. And you've got to adjust to another person. Now, there are some things that we need to work on and pray about and, and some things we need to repent of. But then there are some things that are part of us. So if two, particularly if two people come from two cultures, there's quite a different way of seeing things, even about food. And unless we come to some acceptance of that person, that they're not going to change their eating habits, they're not going to change uh, the way they eat their breakfast, or, you know, there are certain things that we, 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 we love the person uh, and they're not going to change some things because they're not necessarily sinful things. So we've got to make an adjustment to that person. And if we're not prepared to do that, then we don't get married. 
Now, it's the same thing with Jesus. We've got to make adjustments to him and his word. See, he made, God made the adjustment for us in everything but sin because he became a human being and took our life, lived a life like we live. He did that because a lot of people would say, well, what, you know, God expects me to adjust to him. Why doesn't, he, why doesn't he adjust to me? Well, he has in everything but sin. He's adjusted. He became just like one of us. That was a greater adjustment than the adjustment that we have to make towards him. So we're, we're called to adjust to his teaching in every way. What does it say about uh, gossip? What does it say about drunkenness? What does it say about uh, infidelity? Well, we can't just raise our hands and say, well, that's it. No, we have to adjust to the teachings of the Scripture, to the teachings of Jesus Christ, because that's what we have to do. Because if we're in Christ, then we have to adjust to his way of life, to his teaching, to he, the way he sees things. Now, it's a progression in some things. In the big things, it usually should happen quickly. But in, the, in a lot of things, it's a progression. It certainly has been a progression for me. Hopefully it's a progression for you. But the main thing is that we're progressing. We, we, we've made more into the image of Jesus Christ. So there is a demand. And this is uh, New Testament believers sometimes don't see it this way, don't get it. There is a demand to change. Okay? It's not... There is that... that there is that requirement by Jesus Christ for us to be different. And that is not by keeping rules or by trying hard, but to conform ourselves to Jesus and to his way of life and to his teachings and asking the Holy Spirit to help us to do so. That's the way it is. That's what the writer of the Hebrews is urging the, the writer to the Hebrews to do. And we use the example of... Um, of, of what Jesus taught about marriage. It's very, very clear. So this is also speaking to us. Uh, because otherwise we won't believe that we need to adjust. That we can just keep living our life the way we please. And that's not the way God wants us to, to live our life. That's not the way Jesus Christ wants us to live our life because he is the final word. He is the word made flesh and dwelt amongst us. That We have to adjust to his way. All the time in my life I've been challenged, even before I had a big born-again conversion experience, uh, to adjust to the teachings of Jesus to live my life according to his teaching. Again, it's not a legalism. It's not keeping laws and ticking them off morning and night. It's knowing what Jesus wants and what he said and what he expects of us and asking the Holy Spirit to help us fulfill that. Because we, you know, on our own, we can't do it. If we do it on our own, we'll either get very proud and become a, you know, a, a, a Pharisee judging others, or if we, if if we give in, we become hopeless. We just say, "What's the use?" I'll just, and that's what's happened to a lot of people, by the way. See, they think that Christianity is simply a moralistic religion where you just got to do things, and because they haven't met Christ. And because they haven't had an understanding, they've given up. And a lot of the people that are in this argument, there will be some of them in that, that that's their, that's their reasoning. Because they've never been taught how, if some of them may not be open, that's, we can't, I, but some may have been open, if they were taught how to connect with Christ. And how he can change you. There are many stories about people who are living different lifestyles. Who met Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit changed.
They adjusted to the teachings of Jesus. Not by moralism, not by just legalism, but by the experience of Christ and the power of his spirit. God helped them and they have, uh, they lead a different life. So Jesus is the unsurpassable form in which God appears. This is straight from Timothy Keller. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, then he is transformed with ever-increasing potential into his glory. Um, and the key, as it says there, is we're gazing on the glory of God. Uh, there was another scripture I was going to read from Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, which I won't read now. But, you know, we, we, once we are, when we are in this process, we are adjusting and we become changed more into the glory of God. So the glory of God dwells within in us. We were praying the other day uh, as leaders and KC had a word for someone. And he saw while the outward body w would fade away, he saw a picture of the skeleton of this person radiating the glory of God. Radiating the glory of God. Because inside us, that's what we've got. The Spirit of God. Do you want to radiate the glory of God? That's what we want to do. I want to radiate the glory of God. See, re the reason Jesus can bring us to the, f in the final truth is because he is God of truth. So don't forget that when we read the scripture... The scripture, you know, we can, we can read the book of Hebrews, but it was written to people like us. They were, and they were having a tougher time than us. But if you read it, there's some strong words there. Again, we've always got to, uh, you know, speak that in, in this modern day, we, we're not here, you know, it's not like, you know, again, it's not that God wants to just tell us what to do and we've got to, you know, it's not like that at all. But there is a change and it's in that that we hold our position. Another issue that's coming up for us is euthanasia. All right? That's coming up. It's one of the next ones. And again, there are... If you're not a Christian, there are always some arguments that sound good. But as a Christian, I can't hold that position. I can't hold that position. It's as simple as that. Because only God has the right to give and take life. Okay? So again, we come back to this. I'm just sharing this this morning because I, want, I don't want anyone to be confused. I don't want anyone to be overly burdened. I don't want anyone to feel they've got to have all the arguments. Because when you get out there, you know, oh, you're not fair. You're not, you know, you're not giving everyone the same right. It's got nothing to do with those sorts of things. It has to do with Jesus Christ, with God and what God allows and what God permits and what he doesn't, ultimately. What's stopping one person, you know, which is another one, another thing that we'll have to be careful of, of having five wives or three men and two women getting together. You know? That's what's coming. So, you know, this is simply a doorway to all of that. So, again, it's not the way God wants us to live. We're Christians. Doesn't matter what brand we are, but we're Christians. Okay, that's the main thing. And we, 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 we're going to stick to Jesus Christ, to his word, that all of a sudden... 
after 2,000 years, there cannot be a different teaching. Even if you, if you left the Bible out, you can't do that. You can't have a different teaching after 2,000 years. Something that, it's impossible. Can't be done. So that's what I'm trying to say. So anyway, to close it off, It's tough sometimes because we do have to adjust and change. Like we have to adjust and change to another person in marriage or even in the community. A lot of people don't want to come to a community like this because you get closer and you've got to make adjustments. That's why it's easy just to go to a church on a Sunday, go in and out and see no one and speak to no one and have to relate to anyone. That's fine. There's not going to be much adjustment there. And it's not a criticism, it's just a fact that, you, you know, there isn't time for any adjustment. It, it's, it's in and out. But when you come to a place like this, you are going to be confronted. You're going to be confronted by your own sin and the sin of others. And the, the, the decision has to be made, as God called me here? That's the, the most important question you have to ask. If he has, then you've got to go it. If he hasn't, then find the place that he's called you to. So, we're privileged to know Jesus. I mean, ultimately, what a privilege it is. What a privilege to live this life that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, you could search the whole world over and there's nothing like knowing Jesus Christ. And particularly, too, when you can live it, that life with other people who have the same, same mind. You know, and, and, and then you have a country like this. It's just so blessed on top of that. We're in the top 6% of people in the world when it comes to standard of living. You could have been born anywhere. What a privilege. How much, we have a lot to be thankful for. We, we can look at what's wrong and complain about it. And that's okay. If there's injustice, we need to deal with it. But we also need to be thankful. You know, the devil cannot thank. He cannot be a thanksgiver. He, is not, he doesn't thank. He does, it's not in his vocabulary. Thanksgiving is part of the kingdom of God. So to finish, before we have a little bit more worship and close the meeting, remember that you're a follower of Jesus. And you are... Because you're a follower of Jesus, you follow his teachings. And that's really all we can stand on. I'm a follower, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And you don't compromise when it comes to him and his word and his teachings.